I think the, the, the strength of a true leader is when you sit on the board of a company and there are 20 people around the table and 19 people around that table are saying the answer is yes. And you know it's no. Hey, Terry, welcome to the show. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me. It's really great to be here. You've had so many successes, which I'm sure we're going to cover. But the most important thing is, is where did it all begin for you? You know, everybody's on a journey in life. Everybody's trying to find their way to some destination. And your destination, you know, has been many things and it continues to evolve. When I was, when I was 12 years old, my parents took me on a holiday to Spain. And this is over 40 years ago. And you, you have to remember, 40 years ago, people weren't traveling the way that they are today. So I'm the only kid in the class who's ever been to Spain. I have to stand up in front of the whole classroom at school and tell people, you know, I'm going on an airplane. And they're all like, whoa, Terry's going on an airplane. <laughs> and when you came back from, from your holiday, um, I had to stand up again in front of the whole class and tell them, you know, what Spain was like, what the hotels were like, what the airplane experience was like, what it felt like to be on an airplane. And I could see the way the kids were looking at me wide eyed and they were so excited. And you know, I could see the way the girls were looking at me and I'm thinking, you know what? I need to keep a career. I need, I need a career out of this because if girls are gonna look at me like this when I've been on an airplane, then you know, the sky's the limit, pardon the pun. So, um, so I think that started, my parents really started my love affair with travel by taking me on holiday when I was 12 years old. And then me seeing the reaction I got from my classmates when I came back. So it's not like you get yourself an airplane at 12. Where did the real rubber meet the road? I, I know, you know, you work some regular jobs, but there came a point where you're just like, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to take back control of my life. Like, let's, let's go to that point where travel really became more so than just a dream. It became a reality. Uh, I wasn't particularly um, great at school. I didn't particularly pay a lot of attention. So I kind of um, forged my way onto this travel and tourism course. And within about three months, I was rumbled by the teachers. They're like, hang on a minute. We've checked out your, your grades and you shouldn't be here. Um, you're not qualified to be here. You're not going to be able to work in the travel industry. It's not an industry for you. Uh, you need to really think about, you know, something else. And, uh, and they asked me to, very politely asked me to leave the course. And I was absolutely shattered, completely shattered. And I went home that evening and um, I said to my parents, I said, Look, I really want to work in travel, but, you know, they've thrown me off this course because I don't have enough school qualifications. And, um, and so I went the next day and, and I went to every travel agency in, this, in the city that I lived. And I literally knocked on doors and said, you know, I need a job. I want to work for you. Give me a chance. No, I don't have any qualifications. No, I haven't done a travel and tourism course, but I really want to work. In a, in a travel business. And very fortunately, one of them took me on. Uh, he literally said, look, I like, your, I like your energy, I like your enthusiasm, I like where you're going with this. You know, we need someone to stack the shelves and make the coffees and learn from the ground up. Um, but if you're interested in doing that, then you're hired. And, and so the day after I was asked to leave the college, I, I, I had a job uh, in a travel agency. That's so what that they call was, um, persistence right there. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? And, and I always have that sort of message ringing in my ears. You know, you're not good enough for the travel industry. You won't make it in the travel industry. And I thought, I'm going to show you guys, you know, what, 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 that's, what that really means. And, and I remember um, at the, in those days, the biggest travel agency business group in the world was a company called Thomas Cook. And I used to say to my friends, one day I'm going to be the CEO of Thomas Cook. And they just laugh at me, you know, like you're a kid at school and this is the huge, you know, the hugest travel business in the world. And you're going to run that business. I'm like, yeah, that's how it's going to be. I, I believed in myself. No one else believed in me. I think that was the thing. And unfortunately, after about a year, the travel company that I went to join, after about a year, uh, they went out of business. They ran out of money. They, I don't know, they just weren't making ends meet and they closed their doors. And I went to my parents and I was 18 at the time. And I said, look, I'm never going to work for anyone else ever again. This, this is horrible. It's Christmas. I've got no money. I've got no job. I, I never want to feel like this again. I want to be my own boss. I want to open my own travel agency. I've been there for 18 months. There's nothing anybody can teach me. I know everything. Because that's how you are when you're 18, right? You just know, oh, no one can tell you anything. Fortunately, my mother believed in me. I'm not sure my dad did, but my mum believed in me. And my mum persuaded my dad to lend me, I guess, the equivalent of about $5,000 to open a travel agency, to open my own travel agency. And it was literally... Literally the case where 
if I wanted to go for lunch, I had to put a sign on the door saying back in 10 minutes, because it was just me, only me. Um, and as I got busier and busier, my father um, was, a, was a, a teacher, a lecturer in, in university, which made me being thrown off a, a university course even, even harder at home. You've got no idea. And, and eventually, because the business was, was going so well, my father used to come in on an evening and he would be the, uh, the back office. He would pay the checks and you know, pay the bills and I would be out the front selling. We built the business. I built the business over about six or seven years from, from literally one shop to around 30 shops when we got an offer to sell the company and my father took the offer and, and, and literally four or five years after backing me became a multimillionaire from his $5,000 loan. And, um, and I stayed on because I, I was, I was far too young to sell in those days. And I stayed um, and built a, a, a huge travel business that we then, that we then created. But my dad, I think was about 55 at the time. He's, he, he never worked another day in his life after that. And my parents went from having a very humble lifestyle to having a, a fairly lavish lifestyle um, because they they had the foresight and the um, and the money, fortunately, to back me uh, when I was eighteen. And it, and it was fantastic to be able to sort of repay that that loan, that debt, that you know, um, to such an extent that they actually never had to work again, which is what an honor. What an honor. I eventually, when my father sold, um, we had 32 stores. When, when I sold three years later, we had 132 stores. And, um, and one of the, one of the th funny things is that he made a lot of money um, three years earlier, but, but was a little bit, I guess, um, envious of the fact that I made so much more money three years later. To yeah. the point now, and you're going to love this, <laughs> to the point now that whenever we go out as a family, and my kids will, will tell you this is... This is the God honest truth. Whenever we go out as a family for dinner to a restaurant or anywhere we go, my father will always slide the bill across to me when it comes and say, you got more money than me, you can get it. <laughs> and literally it's every time we go out and my kids just go, you know, you know, you're going to be paying tonight, don't you, Dad? I'm like, just don't worry about it. Grandpa's just, you know, he, he just, he loves that. <laughs> So, so they did very well, but obviously we didn't, I did much better. And, and, and I sold, um, as you said, to a, a very large company called Air Tours, who were a huge travel business in those days. And they ran, um, they had a chain. So I had 132 shops. They had 800 stalls in a brand called Going Places. So whilst I said that Thomas Cook was the biggest uh, worldwide travel business, Going Places was the biggest UK travel retailer. And, and I got parachuted in. So they bought Travel World, but they asked me to join the board of Going Places. And again, this is really important because someone believed in me. So the CEO, the, the owner, the chairman of the whole group, multimillionaire guy called David, he said, I want you to go on the board of Going Places, see how big businesses run, understand the principles, understand the differences between what you do in your 132 shops and what they do in their 800. And, 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 and feed back to me in a few weeks' time when you've been to a couple of board meetings, I'd like to have a dinner and, and some feedback. And you've got to understand that I'm, I'm a kid and when you're building your own business and you might be able to identify with this, it's very hard to get a measure. It's very hard to sort of take a, a gauge of how well you're doing because you're there on your own. You're up there on your own. You've not really got anyone to talk to. You can't talk to your friends because they just don't get what you're doing. You can't not talk to your all. staff because they're looking to you for, for guidance and leadership. So you can't show them any weakness. You can't talk to your parents because they don't really get it. So there's no one really to talk to and, and, you, and no one to gauge against. So when I got asked to join this board of this business that had 800, eight times the size of mine, billion pound turnover company, I thought these guys that are running this business must be geniuses because I'm pretty good at this, but I've only got these shops and they're running this huge, massive travel company. They must be amazing at what they do. And I went to the first board meeting and I was completely underwhelmed. I mean, like these guys had no clue what they were doing. Perception uh, is not always reality. They just had no clue how to run this business. I went to two or three ball meetings and at the end of it, I did go for dinner with the owner and I said to him, this is a disaster. And he said, yeah. And he said, and, and what do you suggest? And I said, you need to fire the entire board. You need to put me in as the CEO and you need to let me bring my team. We need to merge these two companies together. So we'll have over 900 stores. They need to let me and my team run the whole business. And that's exactly what he did. He said, wait, wait. So he didn't, he, he didn't even say, oh, that's crazy. He was just like, yep, let's do this, Terry. I am so pleased 
at your feedback. You've said everything that I've believed for a long time. I 100% believe in this and believe in you. And that's exactly what he did. He fired, he fired the entire board and he gave me and my team the responsibility of running what was then the UK's biggest travel company. And, and I was still only you know, 30 years old. And, uh, and some of these guys were 20 years older than me with years and years more experience but hadn't a clue really what they were doing. Great example of people believing in you along your journey. You know, this guy, David, he, he saw in me the person he thought could take this travel company to the next level. And we did, we, you know, we, we turned it around and we really took it. It was called going places and we really were going places. When we talk about all the entrepreneurs and all the, the business owners out there, not everybody has that kind of leadership skills. You know, there's a lot of it. I don't mean to be rude in saying this, but just put it where it is. A lot of sheep out there that like they will come into a position like that and just agree with everything because they don't feel they're at that caliber. I have 100 shops. You have 800. Clearly, you know more than I do, even though I just saw you present something that I think is a train wreck, but oh yeah, yeah, I'm just here along for the ride. You didn't, you have something inside you well, listen, that is I've got, leadership. I've got a great example, a really, really great example of that. And, and I, I'd love to tell you this. So I'm, I'm on the board and, and um, it's a different company at a different time, but it, it just goes to the leadership point you just made. I think this, the, the strength of a true leader is when you sit on the board of a company and there are 20 people around the table and 19 people around that table are saying the answer is yes. And you know it's no. You know it's no. But you're looking at those 19 people and you're thinking, you're all bright people, you're clever people, you're well-paid people, you're very experienced people, but you're wrong. You're all wrong. And, and to, to have that strength to be able to say, I'm right and everyone else in the room is wrong and we're going to go with me. That takes balls of steel to be yes, honest. Yes, it does. <laughs> and, great, and great leadership. But that is genuinely what happened to me um, a few years later and, 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 I, took, and I took that decision and, and, it, and I was right. I was right. But it would have been so easy just to have thought, these 19 guys are all intelligent people. They're, they know what they're talking about. If they think it's yes, then they're probably right. I think it's no, but I'm going to go with them because there's 19 of them. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. You've got to, you've got to stick to your guns. Exactly what I was talking about. So there's 19 sheep and one lion in that room. And the lion came out and said, no, what happened next? So, so the whole principle was that um, th this was a business that was, was vertically integrated. So they owned the airline, they owned the hotels, they owned the tour operator, they owned the travel agency. So the whole the whole raison d'etre of the shops that we had was to sell holidays for our sister company on our airline to our hotels. So we got, pardon the pun, but four bites of the cherry, right? It's a horrible expression, but it's true. And, and, and this is what the previous board didn't get. They couldn't, they didn't understand the purpose of their business, the purpose of why they were there and what the key objectives were. And, and all I did very quickly was at the time that I took over this business, only 15% of the holidays that were being sold were for our own company. And we were selling holidays for other people that we're making one, one amount of commission from. Whereas if you keep it within the group, we're making four times that, right? So it, the maths just is so much better. The profitability is just massively better. So we took the market, we, we, we were selling about 15% of our in-house product when I took over. And when I left, we were selling 85% in-house product. And, and the difference to the bottom line is just astronomical. So, you know, he, he, he was forever grateful. He was eternally grateful. And, um, and he was a great travel visionary because, you know, he, he put the right people in the right places. And, and that was what he was good at. And, uh, you know, he took, he took all the credit for, for my achievements because he said, look, I identified this guy. I, I saw in him early on what I thought was a huge potential. And I backed him and thank you very much. It worked. That's so, awesome. um, yeah, it was, um, uh, that was a fantastic time in my life. It, it, it really was. And um, you were, uh, how old were you at this point? Cause we were 30 coming into that at that board meeting. So where are you at 32, now? 33, yeah. 32, 33. And, and I, I decided to take a break. We, we, we relocated the whole, the entire business. Um, we had to close, we closed it down in a very expensive part of London. And we reopened it in a very inexpensive um, part of the north of England. And it meant that we had to relocate like, 800 staff and new jobs. And it was a huge task to sort of 
close the business down in one place and, and rebuild it somewhere else. And, and once we'd completed that, I decided I, I just needed a break. Um, I was around 33, 34. I had no real time for, you know, for family life, for, for, for fun. I'd, I'd, I'd been running my own business since I was 17. I'd not really had a chance to go out with my friends, go out drinking, partying, none of that. So I decided um, to, um, to actually take a break. And, um, and, I, and I decided to move, actually move out of the country. And I moved to Marbella, where I'm speaking to you from now. I moved to Marbella in Spain and um, came to live out here for a couple of years in the sunshine and just appreciate and sort of celebrate all the things that we'd achieved really up to that point. I think I thought I was retiring. And, 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 and I'd, met, I'd met a girl um, uh, a few months early and, and she had a great job in the UK. And I really liked this girl. I said, look, I'm moving to Marbella. I really like you, but I'm moving to Marbella. You've got a great job. You've got a choice to make here. You can keep your great job and we'll see each other whenever we can. Or you can ditch the job because I've, I've made a few dollars. I'm, I'm doing okay. And you can come and come and start a life in Marbella with me. And, um, and, 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 and she, she, chose, she chose to come to Marbella. And, uh, and I always tell people that because we, um, neither of us could understand Spanish television, we ended up having two children. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so we moved to Marbella and, and, What's the, the the expression is the king is dead, long live the king, right? So I've gone from running this huge business. We had a thousand shops at this point, you know, like 12,000 staff, one and a half billion dollar turnover business. You're making decisions on the hoof all the time. You're constantly being called. You're constantly being asked for advice and help. And, and then you leave and you're laid by the swimming pool in your new villa in Marbella and your phone just doesn't ring. Like hmm. nothing happens. And I said to my girlfriend at, at the time, Madam Wife, I said, do me a favor, just, just call my phone because I think maybe it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> and she called my phone, of course it rang. And I just thought, this is unbelievable. It's like the king is dead, long live the king. I've gone from having a huge, huge profile job to laying by the pool in Spain and my phone has just literally stopped overnight. Wow. That was a huge shock to the system. What did and it, what did it thought, mean to you though? Like when that, when that happened? Yeah, I think I'd gone to Spain thinking, you know, I'm 34, 35, I'm ready to retire. I've done, I've achieved a lot. I've made a few grand. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to move to Spain and, and maybe retire. And, and like within three days, I was like, what's going on here? Oh, that was only three days you made it? Yeah. Yeah, you are, lions are not meant to just lay around and do nothing. No. No. No, three days in, I'm done. I can't I'm believe done. that's all it was. <laughs> in paradise on a poolside. And just because your phone doesn't ring for three days, you start thinking something's wrong. That I you know, I'm laughing because that's me. I go on vacation. Yeah, if I'm is. any longer than three days, I can't even comprehend being there anymore. I don't have a purpose. Would you like to go to the Maldives for two weeks and just lay on the beach for two weeks? Uh, no. Yes. I'll go skiing. I'll go, I'll go to a city. I'm going to do something exciting, but the thought of just laying by the pool for more than three days, no, can't, can't, I can't do it. But the, the, the lesson really was that I thought I was ready to retire. I clearly wasn't. And, um, and, and, and very soon after that, we moved to LA and, and my sort of love affair with uh, California began. Um, uh, we, we moved, we decided that we, we, whilst we love living in, in, in Marbella, we'd love to go and live in California um, for a couple of years. And just, you know, just experience the lifestyle over there. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, coincidentally, was, was opening an office in Irvine in California. And he said, do you fancy going and opening the office for me and recruiting the staff and helping me out? You know, I know you're a little bit bored. You're looking for, for a purpose. Would you, would you move to, uh, to California? And, uh, and that's what we did. And we moved to Newport Beach. And that's when the, the, the love affair with, with California began. So I went to open a, friend, a friend's office in Irvine as a favor. The children were very small, very young, and we moved to California. And thinking this, you know, this could be it. This could be like this could be the future. I love, I love Newport Beach. I love the whole area. And and about after about a year, uh, my ex business partner in my original travel company, who bought out my father, um, had a he had a, another travel company in the in the UK. And he called me up and he said, "Look, I've had a a massive uh, personal tragedy. Um, I cannot focus on this business any longer. Um, it's not doing well." Uh, I'd like to sell it. It needs completely turning around. You're the guy to do it. Um, would you please come back and, and, and help me turn this business around and sell it? Because, you know, I don't, I'm not in love with that anymore. I, I need to, 
I need to get away. I need to get out of the country. And I, and I, and I know you and I trust you and I want you to come and, and, and help me. And I put the phone down and my wife said, who was that? And I said, oh, that was Ken. And she said, what, was, what do you want? And I said, I think he, he kind of wants to offer me a job and um, a partnership. And she said, well, is that what you want? Because we're living the dream in Newport Beach. You know, you really want to go back to Leeds, England. And I'm like, well, he's kind of calling the favour and I feel like I, I owe him and I want to help him. So maybe, yeah. So I flew back to England on my own and I went to meet him and we had a really good chat. And at the end of it, I said, you know what? I, I really don't want to do this. You know, I'm living in California. I'm loving it. I'm, I don't want to come back to the UK. And he said, look, I need your help. I really need your help. Tell me what it's going to take. Write it down now. Tell me what you want um, to come and do this for me. And we did a deal there and then um, over a very English cup of tea. And, um, <laughs> and we, we, we did a deal. And, and two weeks later, I moved my entire family back to the UK and to take over this ailing travel company. And he left, he, he was good to his word, he left and he completely left me to run the business. And, um, and it, was a, it, it was a great brand, the, the business called Gold Medal Travel, it was a great brand, it was really well known in the industry. Um, and, it, but it was behind the scenes, it was hemorrhaging money, it was not doing well. And, um, and we made a deal and, and basically my job was to turn the business around and, and to prepare it for a, for a sale. And at the time I said to him, I said, what does success look like, Ken? You know, what, what are we aiming for here? And he said, I want 50 million pounds for my business. And at the time we had it valued the day that I joined at 15 million pounds. So he wanted to, a massive uplift. And I said, okay, you're gonna have to leave me to it. You're gonna have to leave me completely alone to run this business um, and to bring my own team in. And, I, and, and again, I had to clear out the entire board of that company. And, and I brought all my people back in that I'd worked with before. And it's like a football coach. They bring all their own, you know, when they move, Clubs, they bring all, the, all their, their other coaches with them. So I brought my team with me and, um, and we had three amazing years at Gold Medal Travel and we turned the business around. But, but I'm a great believer, Chris, so, so this is a really important point. I'm a great believer in when you're building a business, you need to know your exit. This is something Bingo. that I learned at an early age, right? Where is the exit? What's the purpose? Who's going to buy this business? And if you can identify that at a very early stage, then everything you do, you can... You can then ask yourself, how does that fit with my aim of who's going to buy this business? So every so we 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 knew that Thomas Cook were the buyer for this company, right? And 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 not just because I'd said 15 years earlier I'm going to be the CEO of Thomas Cook, but because Thomas Cook had a massive gap in their portfolio that I knew we could create this business could to fulfill, and it would be literally be a plug-in to the, to the Thomas Cook um, business. It's all destination driven. They weren't big in, in, in America. They weren't big into the Middle East. And at the time that I joined uh, Gold Medal, we were, one of the, we were the largest tour operator in the world into Dubai. Dubai was just an emerging market. It was just at the point of blowing up. And I knew that if we had the right products, the right destinations, that we could just plug and play that into Thomas Cook's and that they would eventually be our buyer. So if you know that from the beginning, that every, every decision you make as a board you can then question, and always some, somebody around the boardroom table would say, hang on a minute, that decision we just made, how does that sit with the Thomas Cook? How does that sit with the sale? How does that sit with the exit? So we always challenged ourselves. We always challenged ourselves. And we built this business for th in, in, in three years, and we took it from losing money to making lots of money, and, and, and we, we finally put up the for sale sign after three years, and we got an offer of £72 million pounds for the business. And bear in mind, he wanted fifty. And we got off at 72 million, like from the get-go, like there's a deal. And I remember, I remember Ken coming back to the UK and saying to me, look, this is more money than I could imagine. Uh, it's life-changing money. You know, it's a hundred million dollars, isn't it? It's life-changing money. And, and I want you to take the bid. And I said, I don't want to take this bid. And he's like, why not? I said, because Thomas Cook are the buyer for this business. And he said, yeah, but they're nowhere for sale. They haven't come in. You know, they've not shown any, any interest. And I said, trust me, they're the buyer for this business. And I said, I want to go and speak to their CEO and I want to understand why they're not into the bidding when everything I've done is built around them buying it. And I know, I know I could feel it. Every bone in my body knew that they were the, the right buyer for the business. And he said, look, this it's Friday now. I'll give you till Tuesday, but don't mess this up. Because if by Tuesday, Thomas Cooks are not interested, we're taking this offer. And I said, okay, you got a deal. And I went and I called the CEO of, of Thomas Cook, who I knew, um, because you know we're in the same industry. And I knew him and I said, Manny, I said, why, why, you know, you know we're for sale. Why are you not 
entering the race, why have you not made a bid? Why are you not trying to buy this business? And he said, we've looked at it and we think it fits perfectly. What you've done, congratulations. We know exactly what you've done. You know, we're all smiling here. But the one issue that we've got is we think if we buy the business that you and your management team will leave and everything, right. everything that we're buying, you know, we're going to lose that benefit from, we're going to lose that energy, that enthusiasm. We, we, we don't think it's going to integrate very well. And, um, and we think that you, you guys are all going to leave. So we're not, we, we don't, we're not prepared to, to take that risk. And I said, look, I said, why don't you give me and my team a five-year service contract? Why don't you put me on the board of Thomas Cooks? That means I'm one step away from the there CEO. There you are. Job. Put me on the board of Thomas Cooks. Give my entire team a five-year service contract. We'll all transition and we'll all come and integrate this business into, into Thomas Cook. And bear in mind, we've been offered 72 million. He said, okay, so let me think about it over the weekend. He said, what's your best offer? I said, 85 million. He said, that's a lot of money. I said, yeah, that's, that's the deal. So he said, let me think about it over the weekend. He came back to me on the Monday and he said, okay, we'll give you 86 million pounds as long as you and all your management team sign long-term service contracts. So not only did I get the owner of the business an extra 14 million pounds from that phone call, right? But I also got myself and my management team great roles and I was on the board of the company that I was desperate to be the CEO of. One step away from your ultimate goal. That's all I got to say. And there's, it's so cool because I think a lot of people in business start their business because they, they love it. It's their passion project, but they never really think about the that destination of what they're trying to do. You never stopped thinking about the destination. And this whole time you've been given opportunities of people believing in you and you now started believing in other people. Then you started doing one thing that I think, and I'm writing a, a new book, you know, the laws of wealth. And it's the, it's one of the most important things. And that is you started solving people's problems. One person's problem, and that was your destination. You solved the big guy's problem. And you knew it from day one, which is why you knew they were the buyer. And man, talk about being a smart company. They said, we love your business. It's a perfect fit. But you, Terry, are the person we need in this company. And that fit your passion project of being the CEO of Thomas Cook. I just had to recap on that, folks, because if any of you are listening to this, start making changes in your business to mimic what you just heard. Start solving problems, start having a destination and do everything and anything you can to do that. And you'll be, you'll be right where Terry is. So Terry, so now you are one step away from your goal. Where, where do we go from here? So it's amazing, you know, because working in the PLC environment in a, in a, in a public quoted company, is very different to being an entrepreneur. So I've gone from Monday being an entrepreneur to Tuesday wearing a suit. It's like massive culture shock. Um, and, and, you know, you, you, we always say, be careful what you wish for. And I got inside Thomas Cook and, and honestly, I didn't like what I saw. Um, it was run by corporate suits. Decisions were not made in the best interest of the shareholders. Um, the corporate governance was so strong you couldn't you couldn't be entrepreneurial it took out all the entrepreneurialism from my body you know within months of being there it's a very very different environment but the one thing that I did learn is that um, people within these companies are much more likely to leave to move on to go to other other roles than if you're building your own business obviously so, so it wasn't very long after I, I, I joined Thomas Cook that the, 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 sort of the, the waves parted and the opportunity came for me to become, become the CEO. And, um, and it was a dream come true. It was a dream fulfilled. It was, you know, I'd said it when I was 17 and here I was at like 39 and I'd achieved it. And, um, and, 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 and it just made me think about all the people in the college who said, you're not qualified to work in travel. You, you know, you, you can't come on our course to the people all the way along the line. They used to laugh at me when I say one day, I'm going to be the CEO of Thomas Cooks. And it was just great. Like, it was just a great moment. <laughs> It was just a great moment, and um, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Sadly, it wasn't a great job. It was. Um, it was a very, very difficult and very um, entrepreneurial killing role. They, they just. They just knocked all the all the energy and enthusiasm from me so much so that um, the board didn't recognise the the way that the travel industry was moving. So the internet was just becoming a thing. And travel was was a, was was very much part of the emerging internet, 
and, and the way that people booked holidays was starting to change. And they, the, the rest of the board couldn't see that. They couldn't see that having 1,500 shops on the high street and owning aeroplanes and owning hotels, that they believed that was, that was the way to operate the business. And I'm like, hang on a minute, guys. No, we need to be asset lines. We can buy um, aeroplane seats from, from airlines. We don't need to be an airline. We're not good at it. We can buy hotel rooms from hoteliers. We're not good at running hotels. We can raise a huge amount of money by selling these assets, closing down half the, the retail estate, and let's put all our money into building the best uh, internet travel business before Expedia even got started. So and what they, year would this have been? Just I'm trying to like think back to when this change happened. I'm 44 now. Like what year was this? Yeah, 14, 15 years ago. Okay. So it wasn't even that long ago. That's so amazing how fast this industry changed. Yeah. And, and they didn't see it. They couldn't see it. And, and I was... Again, you know, I'm right, you're all wrong. It was one of those moments again where I just, I felt in my bones that I was right and they were wrong. So I quit. Um, and the reason I quit was I wanted to make a bid to try and buy Thomas Cook's. I wanted to own it. I wasn't happy with being CEO and I want to own it. And, um, and, and because of the laws within the corporate governance, you're not allowed to make um, uh, an, um, uh, a bid for a company if you're sat on its board. You, you, you're not allowed to, to sort of be associated. So I had to resign my position in order to try to make a bid for the company. And, um, and I did that because I believe passionately that they were wrong and I was right. And I, um, I, I, I worked with, a, with a, an advisor in the city of London and he set up half a dozen meetings for me to go and meet people um, to try and raise the money to buy Thomas Cook's. And we believed that we needed about 500 million pounds at that time to try and to take the business from um, a publicly quoted listed company on the, on, the new, on, the, on the London Stock Exchange into a private company. We, we felt we needed about 500 million pounds. And um, they set up these meetings over three days for me to go and present to various people like Blackstone and, and other huge um, financial institutions and, and to pitch my vision for Thomas Cook and why, why, why we should get this 500 million pounds. And at the very first meeting, I met a guy for 45 minutes. I pitched him for 45 minutes. And at the end of it, he said, how many of the meetings do you have? And I said, I've got a lot of meetings over the next few days. And he said, play, play your schedule for the next few days. I'm going to give you the full 500 million. Hmm. This was a 45-minute conversation, 45-minute pitch. And he said, yeah, I got it. I see it. I'll give you, I'll write the check. Can't play your schedule for the next few days which was incredible. It's the most amount of money I've ever raised in an hour, let me tell you. Um, it was absolutely incredible. And again, it was someone who said, I believe in you. So my dad believed in me and gave me $5,000. David Crossland believed in me and gave me the top job. Manny believed in me and bought gold medal. And now this guy's believing in me and giving me a check for 500 million pounds. I love so, the journey. You know, it's, just the, it's, it's the same principle, but the numbers just get exponentially bigger all the time. And um, we went back to the board of Thomas Cooks, went to the chairman of Thomas Cooks, and we made a bid for the business. And they said, can you, you need to pitch the board on your vision for the future? Well, they already knew my vision because I'd been hammering it home at every board meeting. But they said, look, pitch the board on your vision for the future and we'll consider the, the offer. So I went in, I pitched the board on my vision for the future and they declined the offer. And they brought in a new CEO and she then started to implement all the things that I told them I would do um, if, I, if I bought the business. So, so they, they basically took all my ideas. That's a slap in the face. Said no to the offer uh, and brought someone in to sort of implement them. Now, the interesting thing here is that all I, talk, all, I, all I told them about was year one. I didn't talk about year two, year three, year four, year five. I just told them about what I wanted to do immediately, what the immediate turnaround requirements were, but not what the longer term vision was. And they brought this woman in and she turned the business around. Surprise, surprise. She was the darling of the city. The share price went up. Everybody loved her because she'd got these fantastic ideas from somewhere. Your ideas. From somewhere. And, and she implemented those ideas. And, and, and for a year, Thomas Cook's recovered. The share price went back up. Everyone's patting her on the back. And then guess what happened after a year? They ran out of ideas. They didn't know how to take it to the next level. And six months after that, Thomas Cook's failed. Right? She's built, she's, she's taken all my ideas and she's run with it for over a year. And less than a year later, yeah, six months later, the whole business failed. And I, I, 
I was back in California. I saw it on the news. I was devastated. devastated. What do you think the number one reason they failed was? What was she missing in year two on? They were still, they were still running this asset heavy ownership. Uh, they hadn't sold, they hadn't raised the capital and they hadn't invested in the internet. Yeah, okay. they would started to close down some of the stores. They'd started to tinker around the edges, but they, they needed, they needed first mover advantage on the internet and Expedia came along and just stole it from them, hmm. you know, and, and they became less relevant almost overnight. Um, and, and, and these new entrants who came from nowhere, there were names that no one ever heard of just stole all the business. Yeah. There were speed boats and, you know, this company was a behemoth with all these assets, which weighed the company down. It was like steering the Titanic. And unfortunately they didn't steer very well. They hit the iceberg and down it went. On so I had, I had moved back to California because there's, there's a pattern emerging here. Cause every time I sell a business, I go back to California. Um, so I moved back to Cal- I moved back to California and literally, um, obviously, I was aware of what was going on from friends in the industry. But I remember, I remember being being in in Newport Beach when they were just seeing on the news that Thomas Cooks had failed, and it was just a really sad moment. It was like a friend had died. You know, for me, it was it was it was the biggest brand name in travel, and they'd allowed it to they'd allowed it to die. And uh, so, yeah, very sad, very sad. Um, but you know you have to pick yourself up and move on and do other things. And, and as a you know, as a true entrepreneur, I'm always looking for the next opportunity. But something else that I've learned along the way is sometimes you can try and force it. Right? It's like I don't know you break up with your girlfriend and you start going out every night because you, you're trying to force yourself into another relationship. And and sometimes you just need to sit back and wait for things to happen. And and I'm a great believer in that. Um, you know things come along when you least expect them. And um, and I was in California and, and this opportunity came along that I, that I, that I least expected. Um, and it was a friend of mine who'd, who'd met these three Norwegian guys. We, um, we invested in the startup music app and, and I wasn't looking for anything. I was, I was chilling. I was living in Laguna. I was having a great life, but, I, but, but, but this opportunity then came and, and fell in my lap. And this is, vo- is it, am I saying it right? Voicey? Yes, correct. Voicey. Yeah. Yeah, so an app that connects singers, songwriters, artists, and producers. And what year was this that this happened? This is 2016. Okay, so still pretty early for this. This is the one where, like, when I read all this stuff and I did the research on you, this is where I got really freaking fired up because of what you did with this. I don't even know how it's possible. Listen, like, I'm developing software now, FinTech. You know, it's a seven-month jaunt with a very expensive development. It's not so much the development of the software, as, as long as the software solves a really important problem. Yours certainly did, mine will as well. But wh- how did you, <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. How did you do this entire thing from start to, to sale in 18 months? So I mean, we, like, um, how did you yes, launch but, that? That's what I, I have to know this. So I sat with these Norwegian guys and they literally had an idea on a piece of paper. That was all they had. They would literally like draw it out piece of paper saying this is the this is the front page this is what it's going to look like this is how it's going to operate and and and, and i just believed in them i love their passion i love their energy and i, I love their enthusiasm for the, for the for the product and um and i said to them what does success look like because i always ask people that on day one you know what 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 you what's your biggest ambition what's your achievement hope, hope to achieve from this and they said if we can make a million dollars each there were three of them if we can make a million dollars each that's more money than we can possibly imagine uh, they lived in Norway. I guess their the, the lifestyle requirements were not that great. A million dollars was a fortune um, to them at that time. And, and that was the, sort of the limit of their um, expectations. We, we had a, a, um, a lucky break. We, 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 built, we started to build the app and we started to get users. And for those people who don't know voice, it's, it's kind of TikTok equivalent. It's very similar to TikTok um, in the way that it operates. You can, you can listen to music, you can collaborate with music, you can like it, you can share it. It's all that kind of stuff. And um, we, we, after about six months of bootstrapping the business, we were getting around about a million users a month on on the on the app was it a was, SaaS was, like a subscription agreement or was it free it was free okay it was free and and it was we were only launched in like three countries at that at that stage um and it was it was ticking along it was doing okay but every month you know Jason and I my, my business partner we were writing checks for salaries and for developers and I remember going to friends and saying look we've got this great idea for a music app would you like to invest in it and every single person I pitched it to said no don't see it 
and 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 we got to the point where um, after about nine months, we got an offer for seven million dollars for the business, and that would have that would have returned these these three guys more than the million dollars each that they that they said was was the limit of their their ambitions, and they wanted to sell. And I said, "There's no way we're, we're not we're not selling this business." And um, unfortunately for for Jason and I, part of the contract, and this is something else that's important when you're negotiating contracts with third parties, but we had preemption rights in the contract, which meant that if those guys wanted to sell the business, they first had to offer it to us. And we had the right to match, as investors, the right to match any offer. Um, So that keeps everyone honest, you know, because, you know, they're not going to try and they're not going to try and sell it too cheaply because they know that I can match the offer. If they get a fantastic offer for the business, then and I don't want to match it, then I'm happy anyway because I'm a shareholder. So it kind of keeps everyone honest, and and it was the best thing that we ever did. So I said, no, we're not selling for seven million. If we're selling for seven million, I'm buying. So you guys decide. And they're like, well, there's no way. If you think it's going to go higher than that, and you're going to put your money into to buy the business, then we're going to stick with it. Smart that's guys. Awesome. That's a very smart move. <laughs> and, 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 and then lockdown came, the first lockdown came, and we literally went from a million users a month to a million users a day. Oh. And we were getting incredible reviews online from people literally saying, if it wasn't for Facebook, Instagram, and Voicey, I would never get through this lockdown. If it wasn't for Snapchat and Voicey. And it was Voicey, Voicey being talked about with these huge companies. And we're like, hang on a minute, are we be really being talked about in the same breath as Facebook and Instagram? And, and we were, it was incredible. And, um, and we'd gone to a million users a day. And literally, um, we, we went from bootstrapping the business, none of my friends would invest, turning down a $7 million offer to literally having almost an auction um, during COVID, during lockdown, between some of the biggest social media companies in the world, um, which resulted in Snapchat buying the business. And, and, and I'm bound by confidentiality not to not to um, reveal the, the full amount, but it was, um, it was a, a very healthy um, nine-figure some and um can you imagine if those three took your buyout because that was more money than they ever thought they'd make can you imagine that and i bet you a lot of people would have so so the so it gets better this is the gift that keeps on giving because as investors we were asked to leave on day one and take our money and take our profit and 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 it wasn't the most money i've ever made from a deal but it was the biggest return and the fastest turnaround I've ever had from a deal. Um, as investors, we, we were we took north of sixty times our investment in eighteen months, which is just unheard of, right? As an investor, you know that it's just. You know, if I can ever find another one of those again, then you know, great. But it was a real unicorn, and um, but the but the developers were allowed to take a little bit of cash off the table, but were asked to move to Santa Monica, you know, Snapchat, put them up in a nice hotel, put their wives in yoga pants, put their kids in school, and. Um, and, and ask them to keep their uh, returns in Snapchat stock and, and for 12 months. And in that 12 months, Snapchat stock doubled. <laughs> so these guys have not only just got hundreds of times more than they could ever possibly imagined, but then a year later, they've just doubled it because Snapchat's share price has doubled. So it was just, um, it was just a fantastic um, turnaround for every, everyone involved. It was just a fantastic exit, fantastic deal, fantastic 18 months. And uh, the negotiations through, through the lockdown with people like Evan Spiegel were actually, you know, fantastic. It's great experience. That is such um, a cool story. I, I, I just think of, I put myself in that place of thinking through that journey of how fast that happened and, you know, how like a tragic event like COVID and the pandemic literally like catapulted the business and that catapulted the PR, which then put you on the level of these giant companies, which ended in you know, the, the fastest turnaround you've done. And mm. it changed not just, you know, well, I mean, it, it helped your life. It helped Jason's life, but it changed these three guys. It was life changing for them, absolutely life changing for them. And, and and we, you know, and I think this is the thing, you know, this is the excitement for me is is is, is finding people now who've got great ideas and 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 great business opportunities, but don't have the the capital to to maybe realize their dreams and to be able to create something from nothing, to be able to build something into a multi million dollar business. 
um, with, a, with with somebody with a fantastic idea and, and and great energy, and and that's what I do now. You know, sort of mentor companies and I um, invest in companies, um, but I invest generally in people, and I look for people with the the passion that I had thirty years ago, and 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 see, you know, do you have the same level of enthusiasm, of passion, of drive, of commitment? And if you do, have you got a great business idea? But the, first of all, it's about people. And, and oh, if I think they have, then then I'm, I'm happy to try and to back them and try and give them a, a helping hand, which, you know, I got when I was 17. So it's nice to be able to reciprocate a little bit. That's amazing. And, you know, like listening to this whole journey and folks, everybody listening to this show right now, I mean, I just want you to hang on to this journey. Started back when he was just in grade school, you know, 12 years old. That dream became real and he never let go of that. And then he set the destinations very early on. It took time, he had to be patient, but it took time and he, he reached that destination. That destination made, it, he reached it, but it may not have spun exactly the way it did, but everything in life happens exactly how it's supposed to. In every single moment of our lives, we are put in place and put in front of the people that we're supposed to be put in front of. Whether or not you realize that or take advantage of that, those are the right people for the right time. Just open your eyes. And the other thing, Terry, as we kind of wrap up this show, and this has been just fascinating, I knew it would be, but I interview wildly successful people, people like yourself, many other billionaires that have just done amazing things in business. And the one thing that always amazes me is most people, when they look at someone of your caliber or, or any of the other people that we interview here, they say, why would you continue to work? You could sail off into the sunset. You could do anything, anywhere you want, anytime you want. People would say that is the ultimate freedom. But you say, I'd make it three days and then I'd be back searching for the next passion project. The next thing I can do to solve somebody else's pro problems. Why? I think I'm just, I'm just motivated by meeting great people with great ideas, great enthusiasm, great excitement. I, I still think there's lots of deals out there to be done. I still think I've got a lot to give, a lot of energy, a lot of experience now. You know, I'm almost saying kind of like the, the, the white-haired uh, experience on the board, which I never thought I would be, but I'm getting to that age where sadly I am. But I just can't, I, you know, I never play golf. Um, I, don't, I don't understand how people can spend hours and hours on a golf course when you, course, when you could be spending hours and hours reading business plans. And for me, that's, you know, that's, that's just there. I'm just, I'm just excited every day by new opportunities and I'm always looking for the next voice you're here for a short while, all of us are. And during that short while, you got to carve your legacy and you got to do things that change other people's lives by solving other people's problems. And if you do just that one thing, folks, listen to me, just that one thing, you will have more money, more things, more wealth than you will ever be able to spend in your lifetime. And it's not because of you. It's because of what you did for everybody else. Terry, thank you so very much for joining me on this show and telling your story. It's been fantastic. And thank you, everybody, for listening and watching the show and supporting it. We will see you on the next one. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. When you decide and you move forward, not even knowing how, but just decide and, and move, the universe meets you where you are. You're no longer being wishy-washy. When I was gas breaking myself, no help could find me because what was I really deciding? Was I in or was I out?